Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm very excited to bring my conversation that I had with Lucy Cook. Lucy is a zoologist, she's a broadcaster, filmmaker, and author. She has a master's degree in zoology from Oxford. She's been a regular guest on Radio 4, BBC, ITV, National Geographic. And she's the author of numerous books, including her most recent book, Bitch on the Female of the Species, uh, which is funny, lighthearted, good science, and uh, just really, really uh, digestible for the general public. It's fantastic. Uh, And that's what we talk about in this conversation. We talk about why uh, the female species has been neglected in many of uh, Darwin's studies and other studies, the binary model of sex, female choice in sexual selection and the social and sexual monogamy in birds and the sexual coercion within ducks, which I've talked about in other conversations as well. Uh, We talk about hierarchies with males and females, female dominance in uh, lemurs, menopause, female bonding, and many other topics. Uh, As listeners will hear, Lucy is just a wonderful, wonderful person. She's so much energy, so much joy. She's very, very enthusiastic about her research. Um, she's kind of a, uh, does, does all kinds of things. She's in front of the camera. She's behind the camera. She's writing. She's on location in different places. Uh, she has a great uh, kind of a social media presence as well. So she's just absolutely wonderful, an absolute delight to talk to. Um, really, really uh, happy with our conversation, and I think it was we we pushed into some really uh, important topics, and you know not just kind of a review or summary, but really kind of thinking about uh, you know some of some of these areas in kind of new and novel ways, and so it was just a really really wonderful conversation. As always, you can find this conversation and all of the conversations at convergingdialogues.substack.com. I'm also on YouTube, so get over there, like, subscribe, follow. Tell all your friends, share widely. You can feel free to contribute. Big thanks for that. And uh, now I bring you Lucy Cook. I am here with Lucy Cook. Uh, Lucy, so wonderful to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for, for coming on. It's my pleasure. It's a delight to be here. Hello there, Xavier. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you've written a, a fantastic book. Uh, the book is called Bitch on the Female of the Species. Uh, it's great. It is it's so well written. Um, I, I didn't feel like I was reading a, a science book in some parts. It just felt so casual and conversational. And then there's all the good science bits in there, too. So it's just really well written. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to talk all about it. Before we do, um, just tell listeners who you are, uh, both academically, professionally, and uh, what you're currently up to. That's, that's, that's going to be the hardest qu- question that you ask me, actually, because I always really struggle <laughs> to describe because I do so many different things. But um, I'm okay. today I'm Lucy Cook and I am mostly a writer. Um, I have a background in zoology. I studied zoology at Oxford University under Richard Dawkins, who you may have heard of, a uh, famous evolutionary biologist. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I, I was a documentary filmmaker for many years and now I mostly write books and, um, I'm delighted to be talking to you about Bitch, which is the last, my last published book, but I'm currently working on my new book. Um, so it's nice to get a break and actually speak to people rather than be squirreling away, (laughs) um, at my (laughs) desk. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I I can imagine the break is needed, especially you know. I've heard that writing, especially writing books, is a, a long slog, and it's such a lonely process for a large part of it. Right? There's a you know, there's a point where it isn't, but I mean, everyone's telling you all their opinions, whether you want it or not. But there's a large part of it that's pretty lonely. So, so yeah, we can talk about uh, your your great work that you did um, previously. So in this book. It really is uh, for listeners. I don't know. Uh, they should obviously pick out the book, but uh, the the book is really kind of a tour through the animal kingdom and looking at the female species and, and different different animals. Uh, I don't. You don't touch really on humans, if at all, uh, which is nice because we talk about humans all the time. So I, I like talking about different types of animals. Why? Why do you think from the beginning in writing this book? Why did you think that we haven't examined? The, the role or the importance or the salience of uh, the female species 
in various uh, uh, animals uh, in a, in a kind of honest way. So what were your, I guess, main aims for, for this book and trying to, to talk about the, the female, the species? Yeah, so female animals have been neglected. Um, they and 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 I hate to say it, but the um, the, the the main culprit is my academic hero, which is Charles Darwin. So Charles Darwin is a genius. You know, I mean, he was the most brilliant and meticulous scientist. Scientist, and his um, evolution, his theory of evolution by natural selection. You know, is is one of the greatest theories that we we have in science. You know, and he and, and the irony is, is he took such a long time before he published because he wanted to make sure he got everything just perfect. I mean, he was an incredibly meticulous man. But when it came to the female of the species, he was blindsided. It was like he was basically he viewed the world through a Victorian pinhole camera. And that meant he saw what society allowed him to see. So when he came to writing his difficult second album, as it were, The Descent of Man, which was the follow-up to On the Origin of Species, <laughs> he basically described the female of the species as a Victorian housewife. She's passive, coy, submissive. And it's males who are the dominant drivers of evolutionary change. They're the aggressive, promiscuous, dominant characters. They're the ones that get to have all the fun and all the impact and all the agency. And, and females are just a sort of feminine footnote to the macho main event. Um, and, you know, because Darwin said that, it meant that, you know, for over 100 years, everybody that followed in his wake just either ignored females because they were thought to be of, of no interest. Um, or they suffered from a chronic case of confirmation bias and just looked to see what he had defined, his Darwin's paradigm. Um, and that had a devastating effect on how we understand all of nature because you can't just look at one side mm. of the equation. You need to look at both sides in order to understand it. So my book is really about the revolution that's happened in our understanding of what it means to be female. Um, and the reason why that revolution even though it's about animals and although we're animals, it's, it's not directly about humans. It's important because we look to the animal kingdom for models of how we should behave. We've done it. We've always done it. You know, we're always looking for, for reference points. So, you know, it's important that we understand, uh, you know, the full spectrum of female behavior in order to better understand human females. Mm. Why do you think it is that, you know, obviously if Darwin is, is doing a bunch of different things with, you know, this, you know, this, this uh, theory, in fact, of evolution, and there were many people after him, wh why do you think it still persists that people have not taken a serious examination of the role of females, aside from this kind of footnote or ancillary kind of, uh, you know, character in the world? Why, why, why do you feel it, it's still, you know, people don't examine? I mean, I know some people have now, but why do you think it has taken so many uh, decades and years for people to really see the role of, of, of females in, in many species? Um, well, that's a, it's, that's a good question. And what I think is, is that basically the revolution that I write about starts really in the 1980s with a bunch of trailblazing American scientists and they, they're females. And what's, you know, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't want to say that all feminists are women because they're not by any, I, I write about feminist scientists in the book who, who identify as males. So, you know, it's not, it's not just women scientists, but science is about asking questions, you know, and people tend to ask questions about what they're interested in. So, you know, if you're a man, you're probably going to be interested in what the male animals are all up to, you know, and you're going to be projecting if you're not aware of the idea of cultural bias, you're going to be projecting your biases onto them as you understand them. So the revolution in our understanding of females really began when, when, when women were, were basically given the same education and opportunities as, as men. So, mm. you know, for a very long time, science was dominated by men and not just men, white men, you know, so it's a very Western English speaking, um, you know, often British, you know, uh, certainly, you know, the early enlightenment was sort of driven by, by, um, 
by by British thinkers. So, or it, so 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 therefore, I think you know the fact that it was males asking questions for a long time meant that females were ignored. You know, um, and what's interesting, I think, is that that the challenges to these Darwinian stereotypes first came from America. So from scientists like um, Sarah Blafferhurdy and Shirley Strum, um, people who were not maybe, you know, in, here in here in the UK, uh, Darwin isn't just, you know, you know, a brilliant scientist. He's not a national treasure, you know. So you c- criticizing Darwin mm-hmm. is, is really difficult to do. So I think it took... Um, for, for women to be able to ask questions. And I think it actually took for challenges to come from outside of England in order to question um, what, what Darwin had laid down. Mm, mm. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense uh, in, in terms of, you know, who's doing the science. And then, yeah, I, I know, you know, Darwin is revered around the world, but especially obviously I would imagine in, in, uh, in, in the United Kingdom. So, Okay, so how do I mean? This is the the question that you know many people have asked. I mean, Simone de Beauvoir asked this. Many people have asked this. I mean, we we're continuing to ask this. How do we define uh, female? What 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 is it to be female? Um, many times, like you talk about in the in chapter in the book about we've used the binary of large and small gametes and XX and XY chromosomes, and that's certainly uh, kind of the standard kind of traditional way, um, but. You say that maybe it's not as simple as that, I guess. Uh, and you give many examples from the natural world, such as moles and the fossa and hyenas, that push us to reflect on this binary model that we have. So I think that's important because a lot of the times humans will think we're super special and we're the only ones that have certain you know differences of things. But uh, I actually think it is helpful to see where we'd see that. So where, what could you tell us about some of these animals I've just listed out as examples, if you want? of, you know, trying to describe for us what it is to, to, to be female. Yeah, no, I'd love to. Cause I, I found this for me was the most fascinating, uh, because it made me address my own biases because, you know, when I was at university, I mm. was taught, um, that sex was defined by, by gamete size. You produce, as you say, big gametes, you're a, f- you're a female, they're producing eggs. You produce small gametes, you're a male. Um, with animals, we don't talk about gender generally because, you know, you can't really ask a, a mole, for example, what gender they think they are. It's a, it's a, it's a social <laughs> psychological construct. You know, it's a preserve of, of humans mm-hmm. in that way. Um, that's not to say that animals don't have some sort of approximation of gender, but it's just really, really hard for us to gauge. So I'm talking about sex when I talk about females in the book. Um, and, you know, so there are a number of ways that, that, as you say, sex has been defined over the years, whether it's by, by genitals or chromosomes. Um, and, 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 and many of those prove to be wholly unworthy when you sort of, you know, just, just, they just don't work when you, when you look at the extraordinary diversity that we have in the animal kingdom. So, um, you mentioned the mole. I think that's like a great one to start with because this, blew my mind, you know. So, I mean, I studied genetics like a long time ago, but, you know, you have this understanding that, uh, you know, uh, f- females are XX and males are XY. And you sort of think to yourself, oh, well, sort of all the genes for being female are going to be on the X chromosome and the genes for being male are going to be on the Y, right? That's like, that's how you imagine mm-hmm. it. Well, mm-hmm. just nothing in genetics is that simple by any means. So, and the mole really tells us that story because the mole is amazing because um, moles, you know, they're the animals that live underground, dig dig their burrows and ruin your lawn by 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 uh, with their sort of conical um, lumps of earth. Well, the thing about the mole is it's really hard living underground, right? You've got to dig for a living. You've got to catch worms in the pitch dark. So evolution's equipped the mole with some amazing adaptations. They can smell in stereo so they can find worms in the pitch black. Um, and they've got an extra thumb so they can dig really, really hard. But the most amazing thing about the female mole are her, are her gonads. Because her gonads are actually half ovarian and half testicular tissue. So during the, the, she's a female because during the breeding season, her ovaries pump out eggs, but for the rest of the breeding, for the, for the rest of the year, outside of that short breeding season, the ovarian tissue shrinks and the, and she's, and she has a lot of testicular tissue, which swells and doesn't produce sperm, but it pumps out tons of testosterone. 
So she's got flexible gonads that, that have tissues that, that go from, you know, that, 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 that are both ovarian and testicular tissues, which is just amazing, right? I had no mm-hmm. idea that there were mammals that had that, that kind of, that plasticity, you know? So I sort of dug into that story and found that, you know, my ideas about genetically what makes male and female was so naive. And I think what you have to do is once you understand the genetics of it, then it just sort of blows apart everything else. Because basically, I spoke with Dr. Jenny Graves, who's this, um, she's probably the world expert in, in sexual differentiation and determination. She'd been studying it for the last 40 years. She was part of the team that found the SRY gene, which is the trigger um, for the male uh, pathway in humans. And um, and she's 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 decoded this the, the 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 sex genes of everything from platypus to nematode worms, everything, right? And um oh. so I asked her, I said, so you know, like how, how does it all work? She goes, well, so you know, the thing is, is we always thought that these pathways to becoming male or becoming female were linear and distinct. And so you have a trigger, you know, in, in humans, it might be the SRY gene. If you're a turtle, it'll be the temperature that you're incubated at. Um, you know, the, if, if, if you're an, an anemone fish, it'll be a social cue. You know, whatever it is, there's a trigger that triggers a pathway to being male or female. And we thought that these were linear and distinct. But it turns out they're nothing but, they're not linear or distinct. They are utterly enmeshed and they are antagonistic. So in order to, in the, in the, in, in the fetus, to build a testes, which is the male pathway, you have to suppress mm-hmm. an ovary. And that suppression mm-hmm. is continuous, right? So you have this kind yeah. of, this, this system where there's this antagonism between whether you are developing a testes or whether you're developing an ovary. And the thing that really blew my mind was she told me that the genes that create a testes or an ovary, they're the same genes. They're the same Mm. 60 genes. They're just playing to a different conductor. And they're not neatly ordered on the sex chromosomes. They're all over the genome. So Mm. you've got these 60 androgynous genes in this antagonistic enmeshed pathway. Um, And then that's how you end up with, with animals like the mole because this system is gloriously leaky and it throws out lots of diversity. And, of course, diversity is the grit that drives evolution forward because, you know, the mole has made use of having flexible gonads, you know, and needs to and, and, mm. and achieves that feat by having just one mutation on one, um, one protein that copies um, a gene. So, you know, it's just it just goes to show that that um, that these pathways, you know, that, 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 that this sort of variation that, that we can see amongst humans, you know, that it's, it's all normal. And it's the product of this this fantastically kind of um, cranky system that's the product of of millions of years of of botched evolutionary steps that have brought us to where we are now. And so that sort of divide between male and female that feels so sort of absolute, when you understand the genetics of it, you can see how much more plastic the whole thing is. I guess the only the uh, that that is, is super illuminating because it, when we look at the the animal kingdom and, and we see you know different uh, things that that might seem like oh that wouldn't that it doesn't seem like how it would be you know in a common occurrence and then you realize it's not even just that it's more of the underpinnings of it. I guess the the question I have with that is 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 there is there always going to be kind of exceptions to things right? So if you say like well you know. Yes, the mole is fascinating, but you know most creatures are going to fall into the binary. How do we? How do we? And I ask that because I can hear people's counter arguments mm. to, to these things in my head. How how do how do we talk about it in a way that's not just well, this is the uh, you know the outlier that's two or three standard deviations from the mean, right? You know, you have the big mm. bunch in the middle. Most things are binary. But yeah, you're going to have some some outliers, and and that's going to happen. How do we not just use that kind of uh, answer or, or response? And how do we understand that it is really this kind of, as you said, plasticity and this type of flexibility for for what we think about with um, uh, sex? Well, I think most sexual traits for a start have a kind of bimodal distribution, really, more than a, you know. 
you know, so so they you know they fall under curves. You know, it's 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 more of a bimodal distribution, uh-huh. and and that's for sure, right? Um, but to sort of, I I think the, the the fact that there is plasticity means that there is plasticity. Do 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 you know what I mean? I just think that when you look at yeah, how yeah, yeah. sex is manifested across the animal kingdom, you 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 see the diversity that's out there and maybe it all makes a bit more sense. I think, you know, I mean, certainly, you know, one of the things that tripped me up when I was um, writing the book is I realized I, I, I wear heteronormative goggles. I view the animal kingdom expecting sure. couples that, uh, you know, to be male and female. And, you know, I, I write about this in the book, um, but, you know, th- there are so many creatures that are, um, that uh, s- switch sex or um, during their lifetime, mm-hmm. you know, or for whom sex is an incredibly plastic affair. I mean, a lot of those are, um, you know, there's there's fish, but also, I mean, even the barnacles that Darwin studied, which is why I think he actually privately he was a lot more open-minded than he was when, you know, because he wrote mm-hmm. a lot about barnacles. But, you know, barnacles, for example, they will they can be male or female or hermaphrodite, and then whatever they are is determined by how many other that they land next to. And then some of them might be, you know, base sort of proto males, but mostly female. And and basically, we don't have the language to describe them. Basically, in in terms of their sex, you know, there was a paper that was published about barnacles a couple of years ago, and they just said that you know we are. We are we're hamstrung by not having the language even because we're trying to sort of mm. you know create all these many many car- categories. So, and I I think that's interesting to see that that that's what exists across the animal kingdom. So, you know, when you consider how many, it all depends on how you slice the cake, doesn't it? I mean, when you look at how many species there are out there, the, those that reproduce sexually are in the minority. Um, and those that, mm. that have very, very neatly defined males and females with a bimodal distribution of traits are even more uh, uh, of a minority. So, so you know, when you talk about outliers, you, we're we're just merely looking at at the world through um, you know through the prism of our own existence again, aren't we? You know, so I mm-hmm. I think I think mm-hmm. to, to what what for me it's just exciting to see that diversity. And to understand how the system is that, that creates that diversity, how that creates and why that has persisted and why it's so valuable to the process of evolution. You know, I mean, we, we need diversity because one day we might be living underground and <laughs> females need, might need to have ovo testes. Do you know what I mean? So, so you know. <laughs> That, that's 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 the genius of it all. You know, we don't we don't know how we're going to end up as a species. We don't know where we're going, but we want to make sure we've got diversity. Otherwise, we're not going to evolve. <laughs> no, I, I fully agree with you. Uh, I think it's important to, for me, one of the things that you know, reading your book and and, and other other people's books and, and papers is trying to. It's it, it is one of those things where it can be difficult at first to kind of push on things we're so used to. But then to say, okay, well, well, let's let's examine that and look at that. And so I think that that's that's a good thing. I mean, I think that's what you know. Obviously, you're saying you've done, and obviously your book does. And so I mean, I felt the same way when when reading about the mall. I said, oh, I didn't know this. It's like that is deeply fascinating. And and then to to know, okay, well, what does this tell us then about uh, this kind of fluidity of of things? And if it can happen in certain species, uh, and we see it in other species, you know, what is what does that possibly mean? So I think it's it's something to keep kind of having a, a reckoning with. With um with with sexual selection and female choice, so you're talking about the uh, the the follow up album to to, to Darwin's <laughs> Origin of Species. He talks a lot about sexual selection and descent of man. Uh, it's very fascinating. Um, and there's been a lot of ideas that have gone around uh, for for a couple of decades. Um, and so one thing in terms of of mating, we had for a long time was that there was the the females do the choosing, right? They're the one. The males try to impress. This is again kind of in the standard kind of way. The males try to impress, and the females are are choosing whether they like it or they don't. I mean, I've seen all these nature documentaries as well. You know, you see the birds doing the dance and the whole thing, and you know, the females are just trying to be like, hey, like you know, 
am I impressed? Am I not? And it's not just birds, it's other animals as well. But, um, you know, but is, is it, is it, is it that simple, I guess, right? Is it, is it, uh, or is there more, I've read some papers that say it's a, it's a kind of co-choosing, right? That the, the woman makes the choice, but then the, the male agrees with the choice that the female makes and that there's this kind of, uh, uh, harmony that's going on. How do we understand, I guess, currently about, uh, female choice and, and types of sexual selection? Oh, this is a great question. Thank you. Because this takes us to the this takes us to the thing that really troubled me when I was at university and I was taught sexual <laughs> selection. And I was taught the sort of universal law that um eggs are expensive and sperm are cheap. So females will be choosy and males will be promiscuous. Uh-huh. And that's like universal mm-hmm. law, right? Um, but it yeah. just yeah. It's 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 just not it's just not the whole picture by any means. Females are choosy, yeah. But males are choosy too because mm. guess what? Sperm isn't cheap. <laughs> because as Donald Jewsbury <laughs> pointed out, back in the like 1980s, I think he first contested this and he was like he said s- somewhat acerbically, I haven't ever known an animal that ejaculated one sperm at a time. You know, it's just it's you know, I mean, if you if you look at the kind of the cost of an ejaculate versus the cost of an egg, you know, there's often it's it's more or less the same. But I mean, you know, when you factor in mm-hmm. um, females who incubate internally, then suddenly it does become a choice, right? But males do have a finite amount of sperm. So, for example, um, I love this story. The um, the Gorillas, you know, uh, I think I think kind of it was the Western Lowland or the mountain gorillas. But anyway, you have it's a classic kind of like single male unit where you have one generally one one male and and maybe uh, a couple of other junior males and and a group of females that he's mating with. Well, the females they 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 want to mate with the with the um, with the top guy, um, but he runs out of sperm. So the females end up brawling and fighting with each other over the males. Sperm. This actually happens in a, a few primates. There's, um, uh, it's the same same story with capuchins as well. Is that the females will will really battle amongst themselves, um, competing viciously for the for the males' limited amount of sperm. So males exercise choice too, you know, and males make decisions that may seem strange to humans as well. So, for example, you know, you always sort of associate. Males as uh, human males as wanting younger females, right? That's the sort of that's the standard line, isn't mm-hmm. it? Well, not mm-hmm. with chimpanzees; they don't. You know, chimpanzee male choice is centered around the older, more experienced females who are going to successfully have offspring, not the young females. It's the older females. So, um, there was this. Oh, I can't remember his name. Ingo Schultz or something like that. Uh, he, he studies he studies male choice actually. He described it as the orphan child of sexual selection, and and it's something that I'm going to be drilling into more in this new book because I think it's really fascinating how that idea of 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 male choice has been completely lost because because of this idea that that males just have unlimited amounts of sperm and can just you know splurge away ad infinitum. Mm-hmm. It's interesting how we, we, I, 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 again, I had the kind of standard model as well. It's like, yes, you know, it's expensive and, and males, you know, they don't really have a thought into it. And yeah, I think I had a few conversations with some, some scientists on the podcast and, and reading some papers and it's like, well, it's not actually that, that true. It is, it, there is a choice on the male side of things as well. So I do think you're right. Is this kind of more of a discovering of that, which, which is sort of connected to the next point, which is about this idea of, um, you make this distinction in the book, which I thought was interesting. I hadn't heard it framed this way. It was between this difference between social and sexual monogamy, which I, I thought mm-hmm. was very interesting. Uh, and and birds teach us, uh, birds teach us about everything. <laughs> but birds <laughs> teach us a little bit about this distinction. Um, w- w- what can you tell us about this kind of difference between a, a social and a, and, a, and a sexual kind of monogamy? Yeah, so songbirds do... Um Social monogamy really well, sexual monogamy less so. So, um, and it was birds that really taught us about this um, because you know you think of birds, you know songbirds. You'll see them maybe nesting in the in your garden. The male sings, he attracts a female, and then together they'll build a nest and they'll raise the chicks. And so everybody assumed mm-hmm. they're monogamous. 
And all the early ornithologists yeah. said that, you know, birds are all monogamous. Um, and then um, this brilliant scientist uh, who gets a lot of airplay in my book, uh, Patricia Goati, she um, she thought to herself, well, I, I wonder whether that's that's entirely true. So she just, she was the first person to ever use DNA fingerprinting on a clutch of eggs. And she basically did a paternity mm. test to see and found that <laughs> a clutch of eggs had multiple fathers. And this... Mm. Information. She she was she, she was studying um, uh, bluebirds as well from Zippity Doodah. So she was basically calling Zippity Doodah a, a Jezebel, which was never going to go down terribly well. But it really didn't go down well at all. So when she presented her information at this big ornithological conference, she was told that the only way that her data could be correct would be if the female birds were raped. Because there's absolutely no way that um, that females will be soliciting extra pair copulations, and it's, it has to all be it's only, only males have that kind of sexual agency. Um, but uh, you know, it, so it took for a long time putting radio trackers on the backs of female birds to discover that they were indeed flying off into other males' territories and soliciting um, sex with other males. And, and it, was, it, was, it was they were <laughs> the masters of their own destiny. They were actually choosing to mate with multiple males because, as Patty says, why put all your eggs in one basket? More chance of hitting the genetic jackpot, the more fathers you have for your eggs. So, so, so that just goes to show that they, and we now understand that. And, and that took about 10 years for that to be accepted by the way, which is sort of astonishing in and of itself. But, um, but that just goes to show really, you know, how, how there's this difference between sexual and social monogamy. So what we can see is a pair of birds lovingly raising chicks together, but that doesn't mean to say that they were sexually monogamous. Hmm. I wonder, I wonder if this is an interesting thing of like, when we see it with with birds, so I know that, for example, um, uh, each bird is, is different in different ways, but, you know, like there is a lot of similarities that we can find with different animals for, for humans. Um, I think of parrots. Parrots have a lot of similarities with, with humans in terms of intelligence and how they solve problems and things like that. I mean, what is, what is the, I guess, the lessons we can, if we can, apply for, I guess this is the this is a sort of evolutionary psychology question, which is, how much of that do we maybe see in other species, namely in humans, of doing this kind of social versus kind of sexual monogamy? Or is it, is it just kind of limited to, to these types of birds? No, it's not limited to just birds. It, we, it's, it happens in all sorts of species. You know, I mean, you know, true sexual monogamy is incredibly rare. I mean, I think that now we think mm. there's only 7% of birds that are sexually monogamous. Um, and that's probably going down. That's probably gone down since then because that's quite an old statistic, actually. Um, and then amongst mm. mammals, the 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 numbers even lower. It's something like I can't remember the. I, but it's it, 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 the figures even lower for mammals, right? And um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, mon monogamy is incredibly rare. Interestingly, um, you get a you do get sort of a, a tendency towards monogamy amongst the canids amongst the dog species um, and wolves um, and, and other dog species. And, and, so, and so social monogamy is, is, associated, is, is a very successful strategy. Um, mm. But whether you need to be sexually monogamous, I mean, I think that our species is very deeply concerned about paternity, and I don't know whether animals are quite so concerned about paternity. I think that's why it, 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 it's, it, you know, it's, it's, difficult for people to take on board the idea that uh, a, a pair might, um, you know, raise um, offspring together, but the offspring might not all be fathered by that male um, because we have this, this we, we consider paternity to be so important. And of course, that's caught up with, with you know, patriarchal systems, isn't it? So, so whether that's yeah, um, yeah. then... That, that concern is peculiar to humans. I, I'm really interested in that. It's another one of the things that I'm trying to sort of get at bottom with in the new book because I think that that's a really interesting thing is to the extent to which, you know, paternity really matters to, to other animals as much. I mean, obviously it does to a certain extent, but, mm. you know, the, we, we, I think we're kind of obsessed with it, you know. Yeah, 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 certainly. I mean, I, I definitely think there's a kind of... Uh, a kind of uh, 
neuroticism or this, this hyper focus on, on, on is, is it mine or is it not? And we see so much of that in, within humans. And so I, I wonder if other animals probably care less. It's, it's interesting. Okay. So I, I got to ask. So I, I've, I've talked to uh, the great uh, Richard Prom on the podcast two, on two different occasions, actually. I just talked to him recently again. He's, he's lovely. And in his book, uh, Evolution of Beauty, I think I got that right. Uh, great book. Um, he brought up this thing I had never heard before. Now I've heard, now I see it everywhere. Right. And he, <laughs> and I think it's, it's him, but I think also the, it, it's the work of, uh, Patricia Brennan that really did this work with, with mallards, specifically with ducks. And so this this idea of, uh, you could tell me how you feel. I don't know how, I, I think people are kind of split on this. I think the way it's described is forced copulation. Um, some people are like, well, it's just rape, but it's like, well, do ducks have an idea of rape? I mean, that's, that seems like a very like abstract kind of human notion. Do we call it that for animals? Maybe, maybe not. We can call it rape. It does. It it is. I mean, by our standards, it would be that for sure. It's unwanted, uh, uh, sexual, uh, copulation, but it, but it's one of these interesting things of, yes, there, you can lay it all out if, if, if you like about this, but that the, the thing that still fascinates me about this story is this coevolution. So, the, you know, the, the male ducks have this like corkscrew like penis and the, the females, uh, uh, I guess it's a, a vagina, right? They, they have developed uh, their, their reproductive organs in a way that kind of offsets the way the, the, the male's uh, genitalia is, which is fascinating because there is this attempt at saying like, I don't want to, this to happen almost, it, it, you know, my, over time, our bodies, our, our organs are going to develop to kind of resist some of this forced copulation, especially if there are, um, m- you know, more male ducks, if I remember this correctly, than there are females. And so there's always this kind of going at it for, for, you know, males to compete here. So anyways, all that to say, I think you, there's something similar there with, with dolphins as well. And dolphins are uh, I mean, I think there's like some fun websites that would be like, dolphins are great. And then you like, you read all the things about dolphins and you're like, oh man, they're, they're pretty actually terrible in some ways. Uh, some things that we don't really think about until we kind of study it. All of these things, I guess, the question I'm asking here, we can use the example of ducks or dolphins is, how do we understand this coevolution of, you know, reproduction, right? And reproductive uh, organs for different species and and what that means about, you know, the, about females, you know, females in, in various species. Well, first of all, first off, I wouldn't call duck, I wouldn't call it rape when it's, um, it's, it's not in, I think rape is peculiar to humans. I think rape, rape is a term which it, it's mm-hmm. not, um, it's not necessarily about reproduction. It's about violence against women. And I think that's a sophisticated yeah. cognitive emotional um, act that is very different from sexual coercion, which in the animal kingdom is basically males just trying to procreate, right? So I think in, in most, yeah. Yeah. many situations of, of human rape, it isn't about procreation necessarily. It's, it's about violence against women. So I, I don't use that term and I don't condone using that term because I think because because there is uh, sexual coercion within the animal kingdom, and by talking about that w- and understanding that that's different, I think that's an important differentiation because otherwise, you could get muddled up with with thinking about um, coercion in uh, ra- rape in humans as being uh, a- a- analogous. Um, so anyway, uh, so what do I think about the the? Well, I mean, I think Patricia Brennan's a genius. I love I, I like Richard Prum's book as well. Yeah. I think it's good. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> I buy. Uh, he's a brilliant writer, uh, but I'm not sure I'm oh, yeah. fully sold on his um, novelty of his <laughs> theory. But anyway, uh, Patricia Brennan, who was his student for many years. And was described by Prum as scientifically unstoppable. I think she is. I think she's an absolute yeah. genius. Because what she's, you know, she's, you know, for many um, decades, we'd known about these ridiculous penises of ducks. And, you know, in some cases, the Argentinian mm-hmm. lake duck, it's, you know, this curly whirly penis is longer than the body of the duck itself. You know, it's a kind of, you know, and, 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 <laughs> and lots of scientists have got really sort of giddy and excited about these penises and they just assumed that it was you know, in line with Darwin's theory of sexual selection, 
which, you know, is it female choice or is it male competition that's driving the, the, the giant penis? And, and everybody thought, oh, because of these coercive acts where you see these males all gang up on a female and it must be about competition. And Patricia Brennan, by being the first person to actually look inside a female, after all of this postulating, she was the first person to look inside a female and found that they had this equally convoluted labyrinthine vagina, realized that actually the females were, um, you know, that it was this, it was this situation of uh, antagonistic co-evolution. Um, and that makes total sense because, I mean, genitals are on the front line of sexual selection and they're on the front line of evolution, aren't they? You know, I mean, it doesn't get much more front line, but well, it mm-hmm. does get a bit mm-hmm. more front line than that. But, but, um, so I think that it's really fascinating where she's now, you know, she's what she managed to do by discovering that is she just sort of rescued the agency of the female duck because she's still subject to coercive act and coercive acts when when males, unmated males will will gang together and will force themselves on on females. And that's that's pretty horrible to see. It's pretty horrible because we have something called rape within our culture, which is which right. has all these extra connotations to it that makes what we see mm-hmm. happening in the animal kingdom seem so much more uh, awful than it really is. But what's awful for the female duck in that situation, it's not nice being coerced, um, but it's not nice losing agency over who fertilizes your eggs. In evolutionary terms, that's all that matters because she does want to choose which male does that. And what Patricia Brennan realized was that she's able to exercise choice because these coercive acts result in very few um, fertilizations. And that's because the curly whirly penis gets caught in the labyrinthine vagina. But when she chooses her mate, she can open up the lumen of her vagina and she can choose the mate that actually fertilizes her egg. Um, So she rescued the reputation uh, she re- rescued the agency and, and the female duck sort of essentially wins that war. But she also showed that there are these other forces outside of competition between males and female choice, which, which shape the course of, uh, of evolution. And, and this kind of antagonistic co-evolution, this kind of arms race, that these arms races, I think are absolutely fascinating. And as you say, the exact same thing does has Patricia Brennan has found in in dolphins, where mm-hmm. male dolphins are known to be coercive. Males that don't um, partner up will, will will form strong bonds with each other, and then they can coerce females. Um, but um, the female has a similarly labyrinthine vagina that means that that you know when you're having sex in three dimensions, you know she's able to just move her body, and so the male's um, penis isn't able to hit the target. So um, you know, I, I, I thought I found these stories absolutely fascinating. And actually, I know you had Kat Bohannon. You saying you had Kat on recently? Mm-hmm. She's very interesting mm-hmm. in her book because she notes that human vaginas are really simple. We just have like, we do have simple tubes. We don't have like a labyrinthine vagina. So what that suggests is that we haven't evolved to resist sexual coercion, Mm. Mm. which is another Mm. reason why sexual coercion and rape are different things. Yeah, yeah. I I totally agree with you on that. I I know people have kind of debated that and and I say, well, you know, I I don't think it's right to call it rape in other animals. I think for the reasons you listed out, so I'm glad you did. But that point is interesting: is how we haven't evolved as humans to to resist resist you know, any type of at least forced copulation at the very least, uh, which is peculiar and, and it is interesting. How I mean, this is a horrible thing that happens to women too often, but it is interesting how uh, we can, I think, in some ways, try to. Uh, because so much, it's not to say that other animals don't have this, but we have a lot of cultural evolution. We have so much social environmental context. I think we can offset a lot of those things, maybe more through that medium than through the body at least. But I don't know if our, our bodies continue to evolve through millions of years. We'll see <laughs> if we're still around. But um, it is interesting, though, how how certain species have done this um, and uh, and others others do not. Kind of with tied with that, I'm curious about this idea that you talk about. Much has been written about it, uh, and different different uh, uh, scientists have written on this. Is this idea of competition um, in terms of female competition for mates, uh, competition with other females for status? Um, there's 
I think, interesting ideas about female hierarchies in the animal kingdom um, and what that looks like. So many people will say, like, there's, you know, these, you know, dozen or so, maybe more uh, species that are more matriarchal, right? You know, elephants and, I guess, bonobos. And, you know, there's different matriarchal systems in the animal kingdom. Um, what, what can we, what can we uh, you know, accurately say about females competing with other females, whether it's for status or mates or other things? And what can we know and learn from, from uh, matriarchal or, or, or societies that have female uh, hierarchies? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And I, I, you know, I, I did a bit of a deep dive into this in the book because I, I was so fascinated by, you know, we, we just have this sort of idea that, that males are all, always dominant, you know, um, and, and, and also that dominance and size are always equated with one another. So, you know, males are always bigger and males are always dominant. And I think this idea of um, really sort of teasing out the difference between dominance and power and leadership is something that is, is really happening mm -hmm. now within zoology that, that people are realizing that, you know, you might have two males, two male chimpanzees beating the crap out of each other for who's going to be the alpha male. Actually, but, but the females will have their own hierarchy, you know, and that, that may, may have certain leadership qualities or, or certain power associated with that. Um, certainly in, in, in baboons more so than, than chimpanzees, for example, but, but all the systems are different, right? So there's just like, there's just not one standard sort of set of how it's, how it, how it is, you know? So, you know, females, uh, are incredibly competitive with one another uh, over resources, over mates, um, over territories even, you know, and, and I think it's really interesting because it, it's one of those things that it's, it's not considered to be terribly feminine to be um, aggressive and competitive. But, you know, just ask a meerkat. I mean, their society is predicated on ruthless competition between females um, hmm. who will... Um, you know, you have a, a dominant female, you know, they live in family clans and you'll have a dominant female and she's actually going to actively suppress the reproduction of all of her sisters and daughters. Um, and, and if they dare give birth, um, she'll kill and probably eat the babies and to the extent to which there was a survey that was done recently um, looking for the most murderous mammal on the planet. They surveyed a thousand species. Humans came out number two. We were second in the survey. Number one was the was the meerkat, mm. where every meerkat has a one in five chance mm. of being murdered by a member of its own species, most likely its own mother or sister. You know, so so they're incredibly uh, violent, and uh, you know, see, uh, mole rats are even more so, and and social insects. But I mean, they 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 are extreme systems. But you'll see competition between females. Um, you know, amongst, you know, capuchin females, you know, competing with one another about who's going to have sex with the alpha male. So, you know, there's just a huge amount of female competition and, and female hierarchies. I think it was, um, oh gosh, I can't remember who the name of the, Lionel Tiger, I think it was, it was in the 1970s, who, who said that, uh, you know, females, uh, you know, unpredisposed towards politics and, uh, and, and, uh, and hierarchical systems. Well, it's absolutely not true. I mean, you ask any primatologist, they'll tell you the females are every bit as clued into um, status as the males are. You know, they're, they're, the, the success of their offspring depends on it, you know. That, so, so it's every bit as hierarchical. And I think what's really interesting is, you know, all of these sort of sort of paradigms that we have stuck in our head, that, you know, males are always dominant and they're always um, big if they're bigger or, you know, they, they just get blown apart when you when you actually, again, you look at the animal kingdom and you see this sort of variation, um, you know, because many of the, the sort of models for human ancestry have for a long time been based on chimpanzees and in particular chimpanzees in in East Africa. Um, sorry, in, in, in West Africa, no, East Africa, you have to forgive me. I get really my East and West muddled up. It's like my left and right. I'm terrible. You never <laughs> want to be in a car with me. I can tell you it's a real, it's a, it's a very bad thing. But anyway, all the models for human ancestry were for a long time based on, um, 
the East African chimpanzees based because uh, Jane Goodall's uh, Gombe chimps, you know, provided that sort of early model. And they seem to be especially violent in their society. Um, But if you look at West African chimpanzees, there's there's a lot less violence um, and a lot more kind of egalitarian behavior. Um, Females actually are the ones that do most of the uh, the hunting with with spears. They they actually the chimpanzees at uh, Fongoli they they fashion spears um, and go hunting bush babies with them. And it's it's major, majority females who do that. Um, and the females are able to eat the meat because you know in, in the East Africa they wouldn't be able to. But but so you see this just enormous variation even in one species. Do you know what I mean across the continent? Yeah. Right. So I think that's what's just so fascinating is that there's all this plasticity out there. So these 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 biases that we have because of our social system, our Western social system that we've imposed on the animal kingdom. When you what we're beginning mm-hmm. to understand now is is that they you know there's just all sorts of different um, social systems and and huge plasticity within those systems um, uh, all around. Yeah, I think I think yeah, connected with that is is you had this this bit in the book about uh, Madagascar, which I, I don't know. Have you been to Madagascar uh, uh, yourself personally? Yeah, I went is to this the eighth the continent? Yeah, yeah, it's it's incredible. Oh, I, oh. I tell you, everybody yeah. should go to Madagascar. I think it's the best. It's the most incredible. I've traveled to like over seventy countries, and Madagascar is in my top three. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it, it does get called the eighth continent. It's so unique. It's so interesting. Islands generally are pretty fascinating, but you give this example of the the lemurs uh, for this example of aggression and competition, but also for cooperation. In this chapter, you also aren't the biggest fan of uh, Rangham's law for for bonobos as well. So, so t- <laughs> which I thought was really interesting. Um, I, I liked a lot of your comments there. So, what it, what it, what do we make about? You know, this is an example. You can use lemurs as the example here, but uh, of of competition and cooperation, uh, aggression with with uh, different different uh, animals that we see. Um. So, well, the lemurs are really fascinating because um, uh, they're mostly female dominant uh, as a species. Uh, um, well, uh, uh, there is one hundred and eleven different species of, of lemur in actual fact, and. Ninety percent of them are female dominant, and the females are really aggressively dominant. The males. Alison Jolly was the first person to notice this, and she wrote about it in the all the way back in the nineteen sixties, and was completely ignored. Like nobody was interested in her tales of, mm. of female dominance in this sort of, um, you know, very um, uh, uh, in in a, in this uh, primate, and um, uh, you know. So, so you have, um, you know, females are, you know, what's, what's interesting is females, females and males are more or less the same size, but, but, um, females, you know, if they, if they, I went to this baobab tree, which was a great example of where you see female dominance at play in Madagascar. I was with, um, Rebecca Lewis is a sort of, um, who's, uh, a, a primatologist, anthropologist who's been studying the, the shifak in in madagascar for a long time and she said yeah if you want to see you want to see female dominance play come to a baobab tree because in the dry season there's nothing else to eat in the forest there's nothing there's just you know the only tree that has any fruit on it is the baobab tree but the baobab fruits are rock hard and 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 uh, lemurs have got really bad teeth they've got this sort of basic sort of tooth comb and it takes them about an hour gnawing away to get through this this uh, fruit shell. And, you know, if a male might spend an hour gnawing away and then he gets into the fleshy, uh, heavy fatty acid fruit inside and gets whacked over the head and the female just take it off him. And so the males end up all pogoing along underneath the baobab tree, picking up the scraps of orange fruit that that they can find on the floor that they're they're permitted to eat, while the females, you know, dine on the fruit um, in the trees that they've spent all the time breaking into. And what's fascinating about the fact that they, you have female dominance in 90% of the lemur species is that, you know, because they are such an early offshoot from the primate line and the other prosimians, the bush babies and galagas, also are female dominant. It suggests that the ancestor of all primates was a female dominant species. So, you know, that turns everything on its head, doesn't it? Um, 
But, you know, I think what's interesting, you know, and then you have the bonobos where, you know, the females, um, you know, uh, uh, in, in most cases, I mean, I think it's it's often, it can be a kind of in the wild, a mixed dominant system where you'll have, often it's a female at the top, then it might be her son and then other females. It's, it's not strictly kind of... Um, all females, uh, all above, yeah. all males. Same with uh, hyenas. It's it's not yeah. as neat as that. And again, that's interesting, right? Because we think of them as being yeah. separate, yeah. you know, but actually you see these systems that there's just a lot more flexibility. And ultimately, it's, it's a product of the environment that they find themselves in and evolutionary time and, you know, that, that shapes something yeah. peculiar. As we are peculiar ourselves, you know, fa- shaped by all these factors. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really good point because we, <laughs> in the book, I had a, <clears throat> I had to, I don't know if this is true for you in writing it or maybe for other folks that have read it, but it was a lot of having to, um, for the moment when I would read a particular part or chapter was, let me just set on the shelf what I, what I understand and know, and let me just be open to seeing it in a different way. Now, you know, people can agree or disagree or there might need to be more research done on things. But that's the wonderful thing about the natural world and about science is to always push us to say, how do we, you know, kind of at the end of the day, these are all theories and models. And, and some of them are are factual for, for sure. Um, but a lot of them are, are rooted in, you know, theories or models that need to be uh, updated or they need to be adjusted or we need to adapt to things. And so I. I it, it's a, it was, that's what makes your book so engaging is because it's like, oh, okay, well, that's not, that's not what I learned in, 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 in undergrad or, <laughs> or whatever. It's like, well, wait a minute. Is that, is that, is that how that works? And it's like, okay, well, that, that's good evidence. Okay. You know, how is this something you, we can keep kind of coming back to? So one of these things, which is, you know, I'll be very honest. Um, you know, I, as a, as a man, I, um, will not go through, uh, menopause. Um, and so there's this interesting thing about an experience that I'll never experience as a human being that so many of, uh, you know, wonderful, uh, you know, women in my life, my wife and my daughter and, you know, my mother and all these, all these people will go through at some point. And it's like, well, what, what is this experience I'm never going to have? And I, I find it, uh, strangely fascinating to me, this, this period. Um, and I remember. One time I was, I was, I was actually in a bookstore, uh, it must've been a Barnes and Noble or something. And I saw this book on the shelf, really interesting. Uh, the book was called the slow moon climbs. It's by Susan Mattern. Um, she's a historian, I believe. And, uh, and I read it and it was all about a history of menopause, uh, in humans mostly. Um, and I, I remember thinking to myself, I've never read a book on this. This was fascinating. And I was, I read it. Uh, uh, another time later in, in, uh, a couple years later. And I was very fortunate to, to have her on the podcast and she was very generous. We talked for about two hours and she told me all about, you know, she was very interested about, you know, as she was coming at the time upon menopause and trying to find a good book on it and didn't really have one. So she wrote it and uh, it's, it's very well researched and things like that. She has some interesting ideas in the latter half of the book. Uh, I've talked to Nicola Rehani. She's a friend. She's mentioned uh, uh, menopause in her book, Social Instinct. I talked with Kat Bohannon. She mentioned menopause. It does keep coming up. And the prevalent theme, it's in your book as well, the prevalent hypothesis there is this grandmother hypothesis. Uh, hypothesis excuse me. And uh, Kat has a different take on it. She, doesn't, she, she, she thinks that it's more about uh, women continue to live past childbearing years, uh, in terms of like a kind of, uh, social wisdom kind of thing of like, well, they've lived life long enough to tell other younger generations, you know, to avoid predators in certain places or to avoid harm or things like that. So it's kind of this download all this wisdom. Sometimes it's just the fact of helping to raise children because that's necessary. So all of these different ideas here, I guess, what is your print on this? What is, where do you come down on, on menopause, uh, for what we see in other, other animals? I believe, um, I believe, uh, orcas have them. We know that maybe elephants, maybe some other primates. I can't remember who else does. Obviously humans do, but it, it feels pretty distinct to humans, although not exclusively. 
But uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on on menopause and the grandmother hypothesis or alternative hypothesis? What are your, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, no, I, lo- I love this subject. Obviously, I'm, I'm somebody who's right in the middle of it. And um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. You know, it's, like, it's not, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I'd be really happy to carry on producing estrogen for the rest of my life if just something something weird happened and I was able to, you know, it would be really nice. Um, so uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's a funky old ride. But um, yeah, so, um, but it's, it's incredibly rare in the animal kingdom, right? Because um, I mean, whether that's just a factor yeah. of the fact that it hasn't been studied, I suspect that has something to do with it. But mm-hmm. basically, natural yeah. selection takes yeah. a pretty dim view of a loss of fertility. And if you stop reproducing, you die. That's how it works, yeah. mostly. Yeah. So human women were thought of as being menopausal freaks, you know, and actually, um, you know, there was, there was sort of, you know, there was one theory about how, you know, the only other, for a long time, the only other species that we knew of to go through the menopause were in zoos. So there was like the odd gorilla or chimpanzee. And the idea was that they were propped up by regular meals and medicine. So they were outliving their ovaries. So they were living there. And they, we were the same. Women were the same. We, we should really be, you know, shuffling off round about now, you know, in my case, literally this second. Um but um, so uh, so you know, so it's, it's a really sort of depressing uh, view, and uh, and then there's the grandmother hypothesis, which is that we've, you know, we which was proposed by um, uh, Kristen Hawke uh, back in the 1980s, I think it was, that was about um, you know, by investing by by stopping to reproduce and investing in our offspring instead, um, that would be a reason to to stop reproducing ourselves, and it and. So we now know that there are these, uh, these other species that do go through menopause. And it's it's very random. It's not elephants, by the way. Elephants will carry on pumping out babies into their 60s, which is astonishing because they have a 22 this months. so wild. 22 months they're pregnant for. And then they will give birth in their 60s. That's insane. I mean, <laughs> amazing. I mean, you know, uh, amazing efforts. So... So they they carry on and everybody carries on. Although the other day there was a paper that was published just the other week saying that they found that they think that some chimpanzees, um, they found some chimpanzee females in the wild that may look like they may be having um, reproductive senescence. So that's really interesting. Um, and I think cat. I thought I thought cat's longevity idea is 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 really interesting, and I really I I, I get that because what is curious about um, orcas and so 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 there's we now know there's four what we do know for for sure these four species of toothed whale um, orcas beluga whales narwhals as if they could get any cooler uh, and shortfin pilot whales they all definitely li- live live um, long lives um, post um, reproductive. Um, shelf life um but what's interesting in that is is as kat says it's the long lives right because that is interesting that that you know we have humans just this extraordinary longevity and as do those species i don't think that but uh, what i wrote about in the book was that basically um menopause is 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 tied up with not repro- not competing with your daughters anymore. So what you get in um, a lot of, um, well, the meerkats, for example, which are females are killing each other. They're killing their daughters' offspring so that they don't compete with them. Well, another way out of that situation is to duck out of reproduction and invest instead in your offspring and 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 sort of nurture that genetic legacy and so that is and and that's a it's a sort it's a sort of grandmother hypothesis although with the orcas yeah. they well they, they they'll they'll they will stop competing with their daughters but it's their sons that they really invest in and that's really interesting because mm. they really do invest in their sons you know they um you know the sons have a, a much greater chance of dying if they lose their mother um, when she's uh, uh, postmenopausal, um, so I, I think that it's it's I think it's a bit of everything actually. I think often you know evolution doesn't happen for one reason that you know it it'll be an it'll it could be a bit of all of those forces that it's about um, lot, that that basically. Um, you know, orcas have evolved the females not to compete with their daughters who are younger and fitter and, 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 and would outcompete them. And they invest in their sons 
because they're, by investing in their sons, they could hit the genetic jackpot because if one of their sons then starts fertilizing all the females in the area because he's the biggest, because mum has given him loads and loads of salmon and he's huge and they all fancy him, then that's also a great investment. But also, they also, by being by evolving these for longevity, um, the females become these repositories for ecological wisdom and they they pass the culture down, you know, and they're a hugely cultured species with all these amazing different means by which they've they've learned to hunt that are very, very specific to certain groups of orcas. Some, you know, hunt um you know, salmon like the ones in the Pacific Northwest, but others, you know, hunt great whites and just pull their livers out. You know, I mean, they're like, they've they've got a very specific hunting culture and that gets passed down. And the females like the matriarchal um, elephants, you know, will remember where where the water sources are, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, or remember remember where sources of food um, are in in times of um, shortage. So, you know, how much it is of, of any of those elements I don't know, but I what I do know is is it's bloody glorious to discover that we're not alone, <laughs> and uh, and that there are and that there are other females who are doing this, and they're not just disappearing in society in some sort of grey puddle that nobody wants to speak to, um, but instead they're out the front and they're leading it with their wisdom and their empathy. I mean. One of the things that I found about the orcas, I was just un- incredibly charmed by, by, I went to the Pacific Northwest and I, I was actually an orca pooper scooper for a day. I went out with Dr. Deborah Giles, who has the awesome job of, of um, collecting the orca's feces in order to monitor their hormones because it's quite hard to study um, menopause in a essentially yeah. a six-ton swimming torpedo with teeth. You know, you can't take daily blood samples. So <laughs> she she heads out in a boat every single day with a with a rescue dog called Eber that she's trained to sniff out orca scat. And they go out and they go looking for orca poo, you know. And um, so I went out with her for the day and, and I, I was just incredibly charmed by how inclusive orcas and caring orca society is. I mean, they have this extraordinary social cohesion where they 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 have these they, they they remain incredibly close and they have the whole ocean to swim in, but they remain very close, physically often very close. And um, they have these extraordinary ba- brains that are like a magnet for superlatives, and you know they they have this special lobe that we don't have that only do dolphins and orcas have called the paralimbic lobe and where it sits in the brain it suggests that they process empathy and emotions in a realm that we can't possibly understand um and they certainly do have this very cohesive society in fact there was one individual that had been documented for decades in the pacific northwest that had scoliosis of the spine and he wasn't mm-hmm. able to swim as fast as the other orcas, but he lived a long and healthy, productive life because he was cared for by the community and the matriarch would share food with him. And and so, yeah, I mean, it just was a really sort of inspiring story um, of cooperation, of a co- it's sort of extraordinary kind of cooperative um cohesive society um, with this wise old lady whale at the front of it, you know, sharing her knowledge. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I just, I love that story. Yeah, it's, just, it's interesting. I mean, it, it, the more and more we, we understand about things, about various animals, you know, we understand more about, you know, just, just uh, mammals in general. And uh, it's really been interesting trying to see all the tools we have to use or creative ways we have to use to try and understand uh, different types of whales uh, because there there's a lot of information to learn from them and uh, they're, they're we keep learning new things all the time about them which is which is fascinating one one last uh, question I have uh, specifically is about uh, when females bond with other females such as in the case of the uh, the albatross which I which I thought was really really interesting uh, talk about this kind of female bonding with other other females and, and what that looks like and and where we where you know the albatross is an example, but where do we see that in other other animals as well? Yeah, so um, for a long time, same sex sexual behavior was completely ignored as this sort of Darwinian anomaly. Like, why would same sex sexual behavior occur? You know, but that's an incredibly Victorian idea about sex, you know, that it's got to be about procreation. Well, sex 
you know, is a great way of forming robust bonds with other individuals. And so, you know, in the book, I describe a number of species where females, because the book's about females, where females form really strong bonds with each other and, and sex, you know, se- sexual activity is part of that, that bond making process, you know, um, with the bonobos, the, the sexual activity, um, dampens their normally competitive, um, nature with one another. And, um, you know, uh, basically the bonobos have, have uh, evolved to overthrow the patriarchy through ecstatic same-sex frottage. So, you know, it's one way of doing it. Um, but, uh, you know, but then the one that was really fascinating to me was the albatrosses because I went to Hawaii because there are these, um, this colony of albatross there, the Laysan albatross, have been studied for, I don't know, 50 odd years. I mean, you know, uh, people have gone along and, and measured the nests and, you know, documented every season, you know, who's laying and you know, how many eggs and all this sort of thing. Now, albatross couples, you know, are mostly monogamous. I'm not going to say totally sexually monogamous, but, you know, they, they, they are um, definitely socially monogamous, at least for, for one season but often for a lifetime, right? And they spend six months of the year on the wing and then they, they, they meet their partner or they make a partner and then they spend six months raising a chick. And they, females can only lay one egg because it's a huge expense to lay just the one egg. And, you know, you need two, um, you need to have a partner in order to raise that chick because you've got to do tag teams all the way to go and get collect squid and, you know, off, one bird's off for a week at a time. So they've been, these, they've been this anomaly for many years, this Hawaiian colony, that there were these cl- double clutches. There were these, you know, there were these nests that had two eggs in them. And there was all sorts of contorted excuses that were given for why there would be these two eggs. And nobody could really figure it out. And then brilliantly, this um, scientist, Lindsay Young, came along. And she's like, well, did we actually check that the couples on those nests are, are male and female? Of course, albatross are identical. <laughs> Males and females are identical. And nobody had looked because everybody just assumed with their heteronormative goggles that the, the couples were going to be male and female. Well, she went around and she took feathers from every single nest and she found that a third of the couples on that colony are female-female yeah. couples. Yeah. And she, was, she told me yeah. that um, she was so shocked she did the lab work two more times because she was convinced that she was wrong. Then she thought, well, no one's going to believe me. And she was right. There was over a third, oh, man. which is amazing. Mm. Um, and the reason why it's happening is, is because, um, you know, often with, um, you know, with animals, you'll have one sex that tends to disperse. Um, either males or females will leave where they were born and go off and seek romance elsewhere. And in the case of the albatross, uh, it's normally the females that do that. So these females are pioneers in every sense of the word. That they're they're leaving Laysan Atoll, where the majority of of Laysan albatross nest, and they're looking for other places to nest. And they've started up this colony in Oahu, which is only about a hundred years old. And because there's a shortage of males, what they're doing is they're mating with with available males who may already be um, in a partnership with another female. Um, and then they're shacking up with another female in order to raise the chicks because you've got to have two of you. And then both females will lay an egg and then only one of those eggs will get incubated. And um, according to Lindsay, it's pretty random. They, they don't seem to have understanding of which is their egg. It's not like they can smell it or detect it in any way. She says she's even seen them trying to incubate volleyballs. So the chances of them being able to recognize <laughs> their own eggs seem slightly slim. But uh, yeah, so the females will do that, and then, and some of these females um, will will mate with female for mate, sorry, partner with female for one season, but then they might partner with a male the following season or whatever. But some of these partnerships just work. And there was one couple that she had been studying since the start of her study, which was you know twenty twenty years ago now. Um, They'd been together all that time. They'd had eight chicks and something like four grand chicks in that time. They were amongst the most successful couples on the colony. They, they, they never mated with the same males. It was, it was always different, but they remained together. And she said, you know, when they see each other at the start of the breeding season, they do all the same dances, cooing, mooing, 
preening, all the same mounting, all the same lovey-dovey stuff that releases a version of bird oxytocin, which is what keeps that bond really strong. And their relationship just works, you know? So, I, yeah, it's amazing. And again, just like a, an example of just how how biased. I mean, I, that's what I mean. As when I was writing the book, I went in search of sexist bias. I knew that there was a story in that. But then I was tripped up by my own heteronormative bias because I probably would have made the same mistake. You know, I wouldn't necessarily have thought of that because, you know, we're all sort of drummed into this heteronormative idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's super interesting to see, um, you know, animals in some ways teach us a lot about ourselves and we have to kind of not get so attached to our ideas or our, our models. So you have to have some flexibility with it. So my last question for you is, um, what do females teach us about, uh, sex, not being deterministic, but rather dynamic and flexible and this plasticity. And, uh, what do you think is the, the future of, of females? Um, well, I think the future is that we'll understand females much more because we're actually studying them now, you know, and there's this sort of, uh, and the future's bright because I think we, you know, what's really exciting is, is that this idea of cultural bias is, is new. You know, we've, we've only really been aware of this for a while. And now we're really thinking about how to do science so that we shed our bias, you know, and, and I think part of the key to that is, is diversity. And it's not just diversity in terms of having women in science. It's about people of different sexualities and gender identities and different languages, you know, people who don't just speak English, you know, and, and are white and, you know, live in America or the UK. And, you know, we need all sorts of um, perspectives, ask asking questions because that's going to flush out the truth, you know, and that's going to reveal the, the glorious, even more diversity and even, 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 you know, you know, and to me, that's, that's the wonder, you know? So, so I think the future's bright. I think the, the females are going to be, you know, a, a much better studied and, um, and, uh, you know, I think that that can teach us enormous amounts about, the role of variation in in our own species and to understand that it is it's the grit that drives evolution forward and without diversity you don't evolve so it's all natural it's all normal you know um and and to appreciate and understand that and 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 maybe under, by looking at the animal kingdom and seeing the the diversity and the plasticity uh, and of the manifestation of uh, and the manifestation of of sex um, will, you know, perhaps give us a little bit more empathy for one another as humans. Yeah, I fully agree. I think as as we as we move, uh, you know, further in 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 our sciences and we try to understand things. It's being able to truly be open-minded, to re-examine various models, to create new ones that are better, um, that are on data, but that are, are trying to really just look at where, where things are at. And you're doing a lot of that hard work, and as, as are many people. Uh, the book is called Bitch on the Female of the Species. Uh, this is out through the wonderful basic books. People can get that everywhere. Uh, any places you want to point people to, uh, Lucy, whether it's a website or organization or anything like that? Um, or well, if people want to follow me, um, they can follow me on Instagram. Um, uh, and I think I'm lucky cook with an E on Instagram. Um, uh, miss Ms. Lucy cook on Twitter, which I'm not really on very much these days. Um, but, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, buy from your local bookstore, you know, support the indies. Um, yeah. because we love them and yeah. they're fantastic. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been a blast talking to you. I've really enjoyed it. Really great questions. Yes. Yes. It was, it was, uh, such a, such a privilege and such a wonderful, fun conversation. Uh, you're, you're just as lovely, uh, uh, talking with you as it is reading the words that you put on the page. So, um, I really, really did enjoy this. So, so big, big thanks. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. 